James chapter 4, verse 14. We want to talk about time and eternity this morning. Verse 14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, tomorrow is uncertain. Not one of us here today know what's going to happen tomorrow. We just have to live ready because anything can happen. Amen. Prepare for the best, but be ready for the worst. Amen. And then for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and vanisheth away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, pour your spirit, anointing, and power into this place. We have come to worship on this great Sabbath. May the hand of God stretch out and do a God thing in this house. We thank you for singing and sermons and all that men can do. But, oh, God, we need your touch in this place this morning. And everybody shouts. Shout it like you mean it. I want to talk a few moments on time and eternity and our lives that are caught up between us. The older I get, the more I see time being swallowed up by eternity. Time is fading away. Time is running out. Time is fleeing, and eternity is about to begin. Soon we will step over into eternity. This temporal life will be over. We will lay your body in a box. We will have a few words to say about you. We'll leave the church and put you in the ground and, and only have memories left. But I want to tell you, that's your body. Your soul and spirit will spend somewhere in eternity, either heaven or hell. The Bible tells us life is short, that we do not have a lot of time. It's like a vapor that appeareth for a little while and vanisheth away. Life is vanishing. Life is disappearing before our very eyes. Have you ever asked yourself, where did time go? Time flies and we're caught in the middle of a flight. We can't stop it. We can't get off of it. Time waits for no man. Neither does it slow down. Because time is short, that makes time valuable. Every day valuable. We must not waste one single day. David said, this is the day the Lord have made. I will. What are you going to do with that day? I'm not going to complain and talk about where I'm hurting. I'm not going to talk about this going bad. I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm going to say this is the day the Lord have made. I will. Somebody shout I will. It's your choice. I will be glad. Hallelujah. Would you give the Lord a hand up of praise? Thank God you're not in the hospital this morning. Thank God you're not in the, uh, the ditch somewhere. You didn't wake up under a bridge in a cardboard box. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Every day you ought to have something to thank God for. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God. Say, God's been good to me. I'm not complaining. I'm not belly aching. I'm not murmuring. I know God's been good to me. Shout amen. amen. My God, we need a good sermon on that, don't we? Too many people gripe, talk about what hurts, talk about how bad they got it. Can I tell you, God is still good. Oh, somebody say yes. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I got up this morning. Thank you that I can breathe this morning. Thank you I can walk this morning. Oh, somebody shout amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So David said this is the day. We need to get time conscious and eternity conscious, eternity minded, and use our time to prepare for what's coming. Focus on eternal things, eternal purpose. Everything we do, we should have in mind an eternal purpose. So use your time for the Lord. Use it productively and profitably for the kingdom of God because only what you do for God matters. And God's got a time clock. And there's a lot of folk that never punch God's time clock. But it's what you do for the kingdom. It's not how big you do. It's what you do something. I like what the Bible said when the unprofitable servant hid his gift. The servant said, the king said, you could have done something to build my kingdom. Who's on the Lord's side? Shout amen. Well, then quit straddling the fence and get in this thing. Amen. 
No, we are so doing, we're laying up treasures in heaven. And our works go before us. And no wonder Jesus said, I must be busy about the Father's business. I have no option in the matter. That's why I'm born today. I must be busy about God's work and God's kingdom. Amen. Listen, life is about priority and it's about balance. You got to get busy in the kingdom. Everything else is unprofitable and wasted. People get so caught up in running the rat race. And if you win, you just top rat. <laughs> Climbing corporate ladders to what we call success, only to find out that we've made a great living but have a lousy life. There's a lot of folk got money, they just ain't got no happiness. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Because if you got Jesus, you are rich this morning. Look at your neighbor. Say, you sitting beside a wealthy man, a wealthy woman. Amen. Amen. Time is not about success or money or fortune. Time's about serving God and doing his will, getting ready to step over into eternity. Live like you're on your deathbed because you are. Live like you're dying because you are. I have many, many, many times been called to the deathbed of someone that was getting ready to say their, have their last breath. I have never had those people talk about money. I never had those people talk about bank accounts. I never had those people talk about possessions or career. All they want to talk about is, I want to make sure I'm ready to meet the Lord. Friend, I want to tell you, we got to get our priorities back in order. We got to get our balanced life back in order. Somebody say, Jesus, I'm living for Jesus. I'm serving. I'm not ashamed to go to church on Sunday morning. I'm ashamed not to go to church on Sunday morning. I'm not ashamed to praise God. I'm ashamed not to praise God. I'm not ashamed to shout. I'm ashamed not to shout. Oh, somebody say, Amen. God has been too good to me. Whoa. Somebody said, visitors are here. You might embarrass me. I'm embarrassed if you don't shout. I'm embarrassed if you don't say, thank God. He's blessed me. He's been good to me. He's been on my side. Amen. Hallelujah. Life on earth is short. And it's about preparing, getting ready for eternity. Listen, eternity is long. You can't comprehend how long eternity is. One preacher tried to use this illustration, and it blew my mind. He said, if the world were a great big steel ball, and an eagle would fly down and hit that steel ball with his beak once every 100 years, by the time the eagle had brought that steel ball to nothing, eternity would have just begun. My God, you can't comprehend it. Another preacher said, what if a sparrow were to fly to the Atlantic Ocean and take a beak of water and fly all the way across the country to the Pacific Ocean and go back again and get another drop of water? By the time he emptied out the Atlantic into the Pacific, eternity would have just begun. That lets me know this life will pass away rapidly. I don't have time to get caught up in stuff that don't give God glory. My priority must be on the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Truth is, really, there's no way to comprehend eternity. But your eternal soul We'll live for all eternity, either in heaven or hell. Now, I know this is simple, and I know you know that, but you don't act like it. You decide which place. 
the, that's really the purpose of life, which makes life so important. As long as you're living, you got a chance. Now, some of you sitting in here today, you ought to be the highest shouters because you got another chance. If you'd have died last week, you'd have busted hell wide open. You got another chance. Don't waste this chance. Don't miss this chance. Somebody just do this. Then there's hope for you. Somebody say amen. We're not like the rich man that lifted his eyes up in hell and said, my God, I just want one drop of water. And they said, you can't have it. He said, send uh, Lazarus back to my family. Too late for them. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe. So when you die and go to hell, that's it. No more chances. That's what makes time and life so exciting and so wonderful. My God. So, so, you know, the sinner man ought to be the most, most thankful man in the world. He did wake up in hell. And so, uh, not only is eternity long, not only is time short, sin is black. Sin will take you to hell. Today, the world has redefined it. The church has put new clothes on it. Now we've got all kinds of churches. We just go where we want to fit in. Whatever you want to do, it's all right. This church believes this is all right. And this one says this is a, We've gotten so far off the word of God. We've got to get back into the word. Because let me just tell you that don't matter what your Sunday school teacher said, doesn't matter what your, your philosopher said in college, doesn't matter what Bible teacher said, it's what saith the word of God. I want to tell you, sir, if you're looking for what sin is, don't watch Oprah to find out. Don't listen to Jerry Springer or Steve Harvey or Dr. Oz or, or Dr. Phil or Ellen DeGeneres. My God, don't look to Hollywood because they ain't got a clue. If you want to know what sin is, look in your Bible. And your Bible will point its finger in your face and call sin, sin. We got to get back to the Bible, folk. There's too many things being taught in the church that's not the word. Bible tells us what sin is. Today, newspapers and TV shows and websites tell us why some of the most vile, unclean acts committed are not sin. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And people applaud it because they want to they wanna do wrong. But the Bible has not changed. And the Bible will not change. And the Bible will point his finger in your face and call sin, sin. You say, well, I don't see nothing wrong with going to church half the time. Just when I get a chance. The Bible calls it lukewarmness. And you'll die and go to hell. The Bible's right and you're wrong. Well, what about just shacking up? Everybody's doing it today. Amen. But the Bible tells us if you sleep together without marriage, you are an adulterer and a fornicator. I'm telling you, the Bible's right and you're wrong. What about homosexuality? Somebody said they're born like that. We're all born in sin, clothed in iniquity. And if we don't go to Calvary, we'll all go to hell. Homosexuality is sin, and you're wrong, and the Bible's right. And we need to preach the Bible. Because while we're preaching funerals, while we get home with people and helping people have some comfort, there has never been more of a time that preachers borderline on lying than they do at funerals. It amazes me how ugly and sinful and ungodly people live until they die. Then they get angel wings and they get halos and they're walking on streets of gold. Come on now. Let me tell you what would happen if it wasn't for things like morphine today. Morphine kills the pain. It's, it's, they have drugs to kill. But if it, they didn't have that pain being killed, you would hear more people laying in their hospital room saying, my God, I'm dying and going to hell. My God, my feet are burning. My God, I'm, I have heard testimony years ago. I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. It's too late. What do you mean? Everybody doesn't go to heaven, folks. What we are doing, we're like 
we come to church like we go to Las Vegas. We gamble on it. We say, what, what can I do but still go to heaven? How close can I live? I talked to a lady, told you this, a friend of mine and his, and his girlfriend, and invited them to church, Harvey. And I said, we love you. Please, come and be with us. You know what I'm saying. You need to change. You need to get saved. You know what they said to me? She said, I don't go to church, but I know without a doubt I'm saved. And if I die tonight, I'm going to heaven. Who told her that? Somebody's got to get in the pulpit. Somebody's got to get on TV. Somebody's got to get on the Facebook. Somebody's got to cry out against sin. Here's the deal about Las Vegas. You could go and win big. But few people do it. You could go and lose everything. I'm just saying to you gamblers out there, and I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about those spiritually. You're gambling with your soul. You're gambling with playing church. Church no longer means anything to you. It's when I come, I come, when I don't, I don't. Reading your Bible, praying, living in the old way, doing stuff you never would do years ago because you have no conviction anymore. Some of you used to, you would not dare come to church and not bring your tithe. But now you've got other things that you've got to spend your monies on. Some of you would not dare uh, uh, miss two and three and four weeks of church and call yourself a Christian. Man, it's getting quiet in here. I'm talking about the reality of time and eternity. Sin is still sin. My Bible says forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as a matter of some is. He said in the last days they would start missing church that have all kinds of gods and all kinds of, you know, you know we think that uh, when we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and we talk about homosexuality, which was one of the traits of that wicked city, that is one of the reasons that God destroyed it. But did you know what else it was? Lot's wife had so much stuff She's so involved with she, her schedule was so full of stuff. She didn't have time for God. And she was so in love with stuff that when the angel had her by the hand, her stuff had her by the heart, and she uh, turned to a pillow of salt. Can I tell you, church folk, listen to me. We're coming down to the last hours of, of the coming of the Lord. It's time to get rid of some stuff and put Jesus first. Because we don't like to talk about hell. We want you to pat us. I, I, I remember hearing a couple one time, they said, we like such and such preacher because he never mentions hell. And I don't like to be challenged. And I don't like to be talked about hell. Hell scares me. Well, somebody needs to get scared of hell. Somebody needs to know hell is still real. Let me tell you what the Bible says. You ready for this? The Bible says hell enlarges itself every day. You know what that says to me? Hell didn't realize, Brother David, how many people would go there. They thought, sure, more people would live for God. Hell thought, sure, more people will surrender to the Word. But there's more people going to hell than the Bible knew. So it has to rebuild itself and enlarge itself. And so we don't want to talk about it. Don't preach on hell. We don't believe on hell. If you do, we'll go somewhere else where they won't preach on it. Come on now. Amen. Somebody says, I don't want to hear about hell. But I'm telling you, hell's a reality. Come on now. God actually does everything he can to keep you out of hell. He sent Jesus to keep you out of hell. He sends his word to keep you out of hell. He sent the cross, the blood, the Holy Ghost to keep you out of hell. He said, prophets and preachers to keep you out of hell. Every voice crying out this morning, his purpose is to keep people out of hell. It's not influence people and make friends. It's not having a fan base and a fan club. It's trying to keep people out of hell. And if you go to hell, you got to go over the preached word and the blood. and the Really? It's not 
easy to go to hell because God is sending everything he can to convict you and say, don't go. And let me say this. You get this. God doesn't send anybody to hell. It's your choice. You do the choosing. The only way to go to hell is you make the choice for yourself. Hell is real. Now is the time to get things right and not wait. There are too many gamblers with their soul playing Russian roulette with their soul. And they're saying, I think I can go to heaven and still just maybe go to church half the time. I think I can go to heaven and, and commit some sin. I think I can go to And we're taking a gamble. And as a preacher, here's what I got to do. I hate this, Dave. I hate this. I've got to let you take that gamble. I can't force you to hear the word. I can't force you to obey what I preach. But one thing I can do, I can scream with all my heart that you need Jesus Christ. Don't go to hell. I'm going to say something. It's going to sound ugly, but it's the truth. Now, I know there's a lot of you, you know, you're in and out, up and down. But, you know, those of you who don't have come, you don't stop us from having church. Uh, is this going to, uh, uh, we actually, 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 are you ready? We really don't need you. You need us. You need Jesus. You need this church. Why are we begging you to come? We can still have Holy Ghost revival with you not here. We can still see people say with you not here. But you need the church. That's the truth. That's the truth. Now, now that's why we send cards and letters and phone calls and knock on your door and beg you to come because we love you. Not because we need you. I see people all the time, they'll quit and five more show up. They'll quit tithing and somebody get a big check and tithe. Always happens. So please don't take this ugly. But here's the real deal. We don't, and God doesn't need you. You need God. And here we are begging you, pleading with you to come. No, 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 no. It's time you wake up, grow up, and realize you need to serve God. You need to be a man or a woman and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Somebody got to quit gambling and get on the word of God. Last but not least, heaven is sweet. And Jesus made a way. He is the only way. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now please get this if you don't get anything else. Being saved is not repeating a prayer behind a preacher. Well, I thought that's all you had to know. Being saved is receiving Jesus when you pray. It's inviting Jesus Christ into your heart. Because little, little, little prayers are dime a dozen. Everybody's got a little prayer book for you to pray. But if your heart ain't in it, you didn't get it. Did you hear me? I said, if your heart ain't in it, you didn't get it. When you get saved, it's surrendering yourself to the Lord. You see, when I got married, I didn't get a marriage contract. I got a wife. Now, how many of you guys, you go and get married, and after the ceremony, they say, okay, here's your contract. See you later. Your wife's going somewhere else. Uh-uh. That's the same difference. We didn't come to get a contract. We didn't come to pray a little pretty prayer to impress and say, Oh, I prayed to pray. It's saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sin. Lord, I want to leave here with you. I don't want to leave here with just a prayer. I want to leave here with you. I want my heart to change. John 14, 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. We're not so would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself. There you may be also. 
Let me tell you something. David said, we'll dwell in the house of the Lord. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more heart. We'll lay the cross down. Oh, I can't. Can you imagine what the first day in heaven is going to be like? Somebody say amen. Amen.